This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Ten years ago, the Belt and Road Initiative was proposed to foster prosperity across regions, infrastructure, trade, markets, jobs, people-to-people -people exchanges. The world is connected like never before. But can the needs of all countries be met in a way that lasts? Amid political headwinds, can trust be built alongside infrastructure? Seeking a shared community for all with the Belt and Road Initiative. Hello and welcome to CDTN special program on the Belt and Road Initiative. I'm Zhong Shi. And I'm Li Tiaoyuan. Thank you guys so much for joining us. 2023 marks the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative proposed by the Chinese President Xi Jinping. Ten years on, the BRI has become the most popular large-scale international cooperation platform with remarkable achievements. And over the past decade, the BRI circle of friends has continued to expand. China has signed Belt and Road cooperation documents with more than 150 countries and over 30 international organizations. That's right. And in the past 10 years, Belt and Road cooperation has achieved fruitful outcomes. It has established more than 3,000 cooperation projects and galvanized nearly 1 trillion U.S. dollars of investment. And to mark the date, CDTN has co-produced a series of programs with national media networks from Pakistan. Malaysia, Serbia, and Indonesia to explore the outcomes of bilateral cooperation under the Belt and Road Framework. And for further discussions, we're joined here on the set by Mr. Harvey Zodin, Senior Fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. Mizun Ahmed Han, Research Fellow at the CCG and the BRI Strategic Institute of Tsinghua University. Mr. Amin Hamadi, Chief Analyst for the African Chamber of Commerce and lecturer of Shanghai University of Finance and Economics, and Professor Zhang Gong, Professor of University of International Business and Economics. Thank you so much, guys, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. China and Pakistan share a long and deep relationship as they call each other Iron Brother. Spanning over 70 years, this Iron Brotherhood has blossomed into a strong and vibrant all-weather strategic cooperative partnership. In July, the two countries just celebrated the 10th anniversary of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, a flagship project of the Belt and Road Initiative. Pakistan's national broadcaster, PTV World, reviewed the changes the BRI has brought to China and Pakistan over the past decade. Let's take a look. Hello, everyone. This is Umar Khalid Bhatt joining you from Pakistan, from our PTV World Studios in Islamabad. We, of course, with CGTN, will be discussing the importance of the BRI with specific uh, reference to the CPEC, that is China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Before we go to our guests and start our discussion, let's watch this short report from our side on how important the CPEC is for Pakistan. This year marks the 10th anniversary of China's proposed Belt and Road Initiative, a global cooperation platform that demonstrates China's vision for global development and offers solutions to the reform of the global governance system and multifaceted challenges. China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, a signature project of BRI envisaged in 2013, has earned global recognition and growing esteem. The CPEC, as a new benchmark of bilateral cooperation, is serving as a powerful, cohesive force connecting the people of China and Pakistan, further strengthening their friendship and solidifying bilateral relations. Under the rubric of CPEC, the two countries initiated and completed multiple projects in the past 10 years in the energy, transport, infrastructure, port, airport development and digital connectivity. Signaling remarkable developments, CPEC projects garnered 
$25.4 billion investment from China. Catalyzing prosperity at grassroots level, CPEC projects generated 192,000 employment opportunities. Additionally, they have facilitated the production of 6,000 megawatts of electric power, the construction of 510 kilometers of highways, and the expansion of the national transmission network by 886 kilometers. One of the watershed developments during 10 years is the operation of Kawada Port, crown jewel of the CPEC. During Chinese Vice Premier He Li Feng's latest three-day visit to Pakistan to celebrate the CPEC's 10th anniversary in Islamabad, both countries reaffirmed to expedite second phase with focus on industrial cooperation, trade, agriculture and socio-economic development. The decade of development under CPEC framework and its shift into higher gear proves that milestone BRI project leads to win-win situation both for China, Pakistan and the region. Let me introduce my two eminent guests who have joined me for the Pakistani side of this important show on CPEC. On my very right is Dr. Hassan Daoud, but he is a former project director of CPEC. Thank you very much, Dr. Saab, to have joined us. Our second guest is Humayun Khan. He is an international, regional and China affairs expert. Humayun, thank you very much you. to have joined us. Let's begin with you, Dr. Hassan Daoud, but 10 years of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Uh, President Xi Jinping also highlighted the importance of uh, this friendship, this collaboration, this, uh, this strong bond that exists between both the countries. Ten years of this important milestone, what have been the important hallmarks of CPEC? I think when we discussed uh, ten years of uh, CPEC, we also need to understand the headwinds that were there, starting from uh, you know, COVID-19 and also the Russia-Ukraine crisis. But among, amidst all this, uh, CPEC has actually stand out or stood out as one of the key elements that has helped Pakistan work on its economy, regional connect connectivity, poverty alleviation. And as perhaps uh, President Xi said, it's, it's a path towards shared prosperity. And it has actually demonstrated how strongly bonded we are, not just as neighbors, but as brothers, uh, iron brothers, and perhaps when we move forward, new areas and avenues would come out. So I think for me, Last 10 years have been great as far as CPEC is concerned. We have improved our blue economy through Gawadar. We have improved our regional connectivity through road infrastructure. We are now working on railway. I think the energy crisis has been over now where we, are, we have had about 6,000 megawatt of energy, around 800 kilometers of transmission line. So for me, it has been great. One of the challenges, Humayu, is uh, the energy uh, shortage in Pakistan. And for that, China-Pakistan uh, economic corridor is pro proving to be a very important step in the right direction. Would you like to elaborate more? This was the time when there was uh, energy deficit in our country. I'm mm. talking when we started the CPAC. And almost 2 to 3 percent of our GDP was losing because we didn't have energy and market was going out. Industry was like trying to relocate. That's exactly the time our iron brother came to help us. Ten years, we have added seven, eight thousand megawatts. Some of the projects are already there and few are going to be completed in this year and few are going to be completed in the next couple of uh, months and years as well. So I think China-Pakistan economic relations, CPAC and overall this relationship is going on in a trajectory in a way where this eco and sustainable development is going to help not only Pakistan and China but the entire region. We have Afghanistan on the neighbor, we have Iran on the other side, we have Central Asian countries, hmm. Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Azerbaijan, all other countries and if we can implement these projects which is the vision of the leadership of both the countries, I think this is a win-win situation and sky is the limit for us. Hmm. Dr. Uh, Hassan Daoud, but uh, the world economic order is changing with a changing geostrategic and geopolitical environment environment, not only in the region but across the world. In your point of view, how can Pakistan and China leverage the China-Pakistan economic corridor to thrive in this new order? I think China's role in the region is growing. Uh, China's connectivity through not just the Belt and Road Initiative, recent events in around uh, BRICS in South Africa, I think they are significant. And I think with this role happening, what, are, what we are witnessing is a transformation where Asia is now taking the lead and also middle income countries are taking the lead mm -hmm. in terms of economic decision making. And as it goes, we are lucky that at this time of, uh, point of time in, in our history, we are associated with one of the major initiatives in the region where regional connectivity is connect not just the economies, but also regional trade. And if it goes forward and with the speed that it is going, 
I think some of the political issues will also be addressed, like in Afghanistan, mm. because you can't just have one country in between which uh, which stays out of uh, getting the benefits of. Uh, of the Belt and Road Issue. And I think the way that China is approaching Afghanistan, the way China is approaching the rest of the developing world, I think we can improve our economy, not just ours, but also of the region. Dr. Hassan Daoud Bhatt, uh, we managed to talk to the Vice Foreign Minister, uh, Excellency Sun Beidong, recently in a special uh, program that was also aired on our channel. In that, uh, Mr. Sun Beidong also talked about the almost 200,000 jobs plus that have been given to different youth under the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. How important is this also as far as one challenge that Pakistan confronts, that is employment? So A is that yes, it has provided 200,000 jobs, direct jobs and also several, um, uh, I, I think more than that. Uh, more than 200,000 jobs, yes. And, but what we have to do is, and perhaps we could have attracted more if we would have built our uh, capacity better, especially in modern technologies and used our uh, vocational center better. So A, yes, it has provided us great opportunity for creating opportunities for job. We were able to send a lot of engineers to China to work on supercritical technology as far as energy sector was concerned because some of the noble ideas and technologies were coming. So uh, that has helped us. But moving forward, we need to work more on the technology and again, their Chinese support can help us. Secondly, uh, I, I think where China has actually helped us is also improving our, in the la past 10 years, our export to China has risen by about 35%. Our seafood export to China in the, just in the last year was more than 40%. There was a growth of about 40%. Our sesame seed export to China has grown. So these figures are also significant when you look at overall narrative that is being built around Exactly, and we look forward to that. So much that we've seen in the last 10 years, so much that we look forward to in the next 10 years. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassan Daoud, but thank you very much, Umayu Khan, to have joined us. And from the Pakistani side, thank you for watching. We hope to see more of collaboration between Pakistan and China in the future. So we've just heard our guest from Pakistan talking about the CPAC and its changes, uh, the changes it has brought to the country and its people. But Zoom, to you, you're from Pakistan, right? You would know this better. The CPAC is actually a flagship project of the Belt and Road Initiative. Talk to us about how you look at it and, you know, the potentials that this could bring to the fact uh, how to narrow development gap in the region. Thank you, firstly, so much for, for having me on this esteemed panel. And... This event is very meaningful for, I'm sure, all of us sitting in this room, but particularly for me because um, I hadn't planned it, but my journey in China began with the announcement of the first phase of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. I'll make some references to our guests who were speaking on the Pakistani side. For example, Mr. Humayo mentioned that Pakistan was de-industrializing back in 2013-14, this is the phase when I started my career as an international relations um, analyst at that time. And I remember when the first phase of CPEC was announced in Pakistan, it was a period when we desperately needed investment and interest. We needed energy infrastructure, transport infrastructure, and the Gwadar port. And that $46 billion announcement changed the, the context of Pakistani conversation. It changed our, uh, uh, you know, it was such, such an eye-opening, such a moving moment for the country that it is hard to explain that sitting in this room. And eight years on from the first phase, we really have seen those numbers speak volumes. But maybe it's even more important to see how many millions of people today in Pakistan have better opportunities. So I have seen multiple projects of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor where you see women working in parts of the country that was unfathomable before. There are hundreds of thousands of young people who have come to China, improved their skills, gotten a better education, and are going back and making changes in Pakistan. We talked about phase two, which was socioeconomic development, and also we talk about education collaboration, technical and vocational education, agriculture, technology, you name it. So if I had to say in a nutshell, I'll, I'll mention three important points about the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor that can help. Number one, it has changed the opportunities, the fundamental opportunities present to Pakistan by investing in the basics, the basics that were absolutely essential. Number two, 
CPEC has evolved with the evolving needs of Pakistan as the Belt and Road Initiative has as well. So today, we are thinking about investments and collaborations and conversations that are going to help Pakistan address its major challenges, including address the SDGs, uh, uh, help Pakistan meet the Sustainable Development Goals, and improve uh, the trade collaborations, technology, fundamental advancements. And number three, which is very important, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, like every Belt and Road Initiative project and the vision, is about connectivity. It is about helping connect Pakistan with China, but also through Afghanistan to Central Asia, through the port of Gwadar towards the Middle Eastern and African markets as well. So we, uh, we must understand that when we look at CPEC, we are looking at the first 10 years of a project and a vision that will be ongoing for the decades to come. And it is changing uh, the mindset of developing countries, including Pakistan, in a nutshell. An incredibly emotional account from Zuan about what has been achieved, which really has proven um, that, that this goes beyond just numbers and the figures that we're talking about here. Professor Go, now it's your turn to catch up with what Zuan has just told us. I mean, this was, the CPAC was one of the earlier projects involved in the Belt and Road Initiative that delivered early results from the initiative itself. Zuan talked about phase one. When we look at phase two, and higher quality development, poverty alleviation, educational opportunities, agricultural educational opportunities, what do you think will be the priorities of phase two? Well, I think um, people tend to have the misconception that the Belt and Road Initiative is all about building infrastructures. And it's absolutely true that uh, Belt and Road Initiative did construct a lot of infrastructures, many countries, of course, including um, in Pakistan, for the uh, CPAC uh, project. But I think um, you know, at some point, in economics terms, the diminishing returns of uh, keep building would kick in. I mean, this happened in Japan, this happened in China. And I think at some point, um, uh, other things will have to follow. Um, you know, like business, investment, trade, uh, and all of these things. But also, uh, other societal aspects uh, surrounding uh, business exchanges would also follow for things you have just mentioned, poverty evasion, um, medical uh, studies, um, tourism, for example. All of these things uh, would facilitate you know, people-to-people -people exchanges between countries, and which is generally good for the two countries' relationship. Um, so I would expect that you know, these other things I've just mentioned would follow, uh, in addition to, um, you know, uh, probably 30, 40 billions of uh, investment in infrastructures um, in the, uh, the CPAP project. Uh, this is a very good thing for both countries, mm -hmm. Pakistan and China. We do see efforts to accelerate China's pivot toward you know, the soft infrastructure, things like house services or digital economy, you know, as new priorities in China's engagement or economic engagement with other countries. But Harvey, to you, um, we are now facing slower global recovery and widening divergences among regions. Against this backdrop, how would you evaluate the role of BRI going forward? Is it here for the long run? Can we see another decade? I think that uh, there's a saying that when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And I believe that uh, with respect to BRI, this is the case. In the first uh, 10 years of BRI, uh, we had a, a learning curve, and there'll continue to be a learning curve. But I'm always amazed about the breadth of uh, BRI and how uh, big it is and how far it's come. You know, there's an a Austrian-American uh, management guru whose name was Peter Drucker. And Peter Drucker said that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And this is what President Xi has done, along with the other members of the BRI. He, he and they have invented uh, the future. And so while the future is a work in progress, I think we can expect great things in the next uh, 10 years from uh, BRI. And the fact that so many diverse countries are participating in it and because there's a uh, commonality in terms of standards, in terms of the projects and things, that uh, the next 10 years, no matter what the economic headwinds, will be uh, ones of profound progress. 
Amin, so how are you looking at um, China-Africa cooperation under the framework of Belt and Road? How are you looking at the scale of it um, and the achievements being made over the past decade? Well, uh, Africa as a continent, consists, uh, as a continent it has uh, still lag in, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, uh, rural development and everything. So I think in terms of need, China, uh, Africa has the most needs in this term. But at the same time, I think Africa also has the potential in the future. China knows that Africa has the future in the couple of decades. So definitely any infrastructure belt in Africa, uh, looking at inf uh, South Africa, looking at Ethiopia, or even Egypt, uh, all these infrastructure built by China actually can help the continent to uh, develop not only in terms of rural development or a local economy, but also to, uh, to go overseas and try to export. Because I think in the past decade, uh, Africa has been looking into a term called uh, the China of Africa. Uh, all African countries would like to copy the, uh, the model of China. China definitely had a huge uh, uh, economic development in the past 30 years or 40 years. So we also, as African uh, citizens, we wish that in Africa we could also have a, co a country that can actually copy the Chinese model and try to come up uh, 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 out to, to be uh, a, a very, very developing, uh, developing country. Yeah. On the other side, I think um, China also prioritized Africa because of the uh, long history relationship between the, the country and the continent. I think uh, China always uh, sees Africa as uh, a very uh, friendly and a good environment to develop their investment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, why don't we turn to our audience? We have 50 college students with us. They are now studying in Beijing, but they come from different parts of the world. I'm sure they have a lot of questions in mind. But before I get to the specific questions, I do want to get a sense of their perception of the BRI in general. So why don't we do a quick survey? Let me see a show of hands. Let's start with the easy one. How many of you have read about or have knowledge about the BRI before coming to this town hall? Raise your hand if you, if you know about it. Okay. Can we say one third of it? I think so. I think one third one of third it. And, and a half of it. That means we're not doing a great job on reporting this. <laughs> okay, so how many of you think of the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, positively? Or you, know, you feel that this initiative is contributing to the wealth of other countries participating in it? Okay. Half about, of it. Yeah, about the same. Okay. How many of you have changed your perceptions um, after hearing our discussions earlier about the BRI on anything? Raise your hands if you have changed your mind. Ha! Ah, why don't we why don't we take some questions? I wanna I wanna hear from you. Yeah. What has changed your mind? What on what topics? Uh, as the Professor Harvey said, we are so lucky for burning uh, such a great era, and uh, we we never take it for granted, and we cherished it. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I didn't know. Um, you didn't know much about the BRI. Yes, before. BRI. But after hearing what they said, I I do feel that I. Mm, I know more, and I, I will, uh, well, I'm willing to devote myself in, into it. That's very good. It's good mm -hmm. to hear that you're willing to learn more about this initiative that China is proposing to the world. Very important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, why don't we have more members of the audience raise questions that interest and concern you to our panel of guests here. Please raise your hand if you have a question, and please also identify who you intend to put your question to. Raise your hands. You have uh, a question to raise, or yeah. Okay, that gentleman over there. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your presentation or your speech. And I want to ask a question. As you said before, that you have uh, the African countries and Pakistan and uh, the countries uh, in the Belt and under the Belt and Road Initiative have benefited a lot from this initiative. But uh, I think this is could be a win-win. But from the Chinese perspective, I think it seems like China has gained less than the other uh, developing countries under the Belt and Road Initiative. So I want to ask a question from uh, 
uh, to our Chinese guest here. Uh, I, I want to ask you, uh, how much did China benefit from this BRI? Thank you. Okay. Um, well, um, the, for every trade, there's always two parties, and from both of which gain something from it. Um, this is purely you know, out of uh, free market negotiation. The other party would not have entered into a, a contract or an agreement if there had been no interest derived from this. Um, now, you ask what China gained from this. Um, well, let me tell you that, um, first of all, uh, it creates a lot of export opportunities um, in terms of you know, equipment being made uh, that can be sold to Pakistan uh, that, that are used in these um, uh, uh, big infrastructure projects. Uh, there are also uh, a lot of jobs uh, created in China as well. I think the, the CPAC is not just creating 100, I remember 120,000, yeah, 150,000 jobs in Pakistan. And certainly I would say maybe, you know, maybe 5% of that, 10% of that number could be jobs created in China. Um, and also another very important thing, um, the infrastructure projects lead to more opportunities of trade. There's actually empirical evidence in the international trade literature. Um, if you look at the um, um, you know, trade between Pakistan and China, definitely there's a, there's a bump up effect after these projects have been deployed. It's, it's actually, this is not just for Pakistan. You look at you know, all the other um, infrastructure projects, they invariably lead to more opportunities of trade, lead to more opportunities of investment. Uh, I think uh, China investment in Pakistan has also increased greatly. Um, and I haven't even talked about, um, you know, the, the other uh, uh, aspects of benefits associated with uh, your field, international relations, right? It strengthens the two countries' relationship. It strengthens relationship between people to people. Um, so um, it's, uh, you know, th this is a, a very important aspect that the, the, the Western world, the Washington, is very concerned about because the Belt and Road is more than just about building infrastructures. It's the, all the things that follow, all the things surrounding the, the infrastructure that make, the, um, make Washington very nervous about you know, China's foreign policy relations with other countries. So I think there's an immense set of benefits that can be accrued to this country, um, and otherwise uh, our government wouldn't have started this in the first place. <clears throat> a great start. I think that's a valid question because many could feel the other way, the opposite way that China is benefiting more from the BRI than other participating countries. Thank you so much. Thank I, you. Well, let me add one more note. I think um, it, it's a moot point to calculate who gets yeah. more from that. Both sides get a lot of benefits from it. Um, it, it. You know, we, we all know that one party is going to get more than the other party. Yeah. But you know, th this kind of a calculation, in my view, is, is a totally moot point. As long as um, you know, benefits from trade, benefits from exchange exist for both parties. And that's it. Yeah. Oh, We've got we have one a... more. Good morning, my name is Alina. As a student from Kyrgyzstan, I have a question to our Chinese professor. I'm very curious to know how you see uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, in cooperation with Central Asian countries in the near future, in future 10 years. Um, what I call the stand countries, you know, the, these uh, former Soviet Republic uh, countries. Uh, you know, th they have a lot of good uh, They've developed many uh, good relationships with uh, China in various aspects. I, I can give you one example. I, mean, you know, I teach uh, a course uh, at my university uh, to foreign students, and I can see for myself that there's a large portion of students' population coming from these uh, Central uh, Asian countries. Um, and I think in addition to this, um, you know, China has done you know, quite a few uh, infrastructure projects, including you know, solar energy, uh, 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 wind energy, for example, wind power uh, projects. Um, as I said, um, this is a region where its economies are very complementary with China. So what it means is that there are many uh, trade opportunities, and, and we already have a very good uh, transportation infrastructure in place, uh, that is the China-Europe uh, Railway. Um, so uh, I would foresee um, many more uh, trade opportunities. And keep in mind, these are landlocked countries, okay? Um, for them to ship things out and ship things in is very expensive. And I think uh, the option of transportation via China uh, and also via this railroad uh, to uh, European countries um, provides a great opportunity 
for these countries to be more engaged in the in global trade as well as global value chain production. Thank you. I hope that answers um, your question. We want to thank all of your questions and answers from our guests. We encourage you to think along as we conduct interviews on set with our guests and hope you have more questions as we come along the show here. That's right. Why don't we move to the next segment? When the Belt and Road Initiative was first proposed in 2013, it sought to connect Asia with Africa and Europe via land and maritime networks with the aim of improving regional integration, increasing trade, and stimulating economic growth. Ten years on, it has become a major driving force for regional and global economy. However, the initiative has been facing continual challenges over the past decade. Malaysia is one of China's major partners under the Belt and Road Initiative, and their biggest joint infrastructure project is the 10 billion US dollar East Coast Rail Link, which had suffered setbacks. Malaysia's national news agency, Bernama, discussed concerns and difficulties of the BRI. Let's take a look. Hello, I'm Kevin Barnaby from Bernama TV, and in collaboration with CGTN, we'll be talking about China's Belt and Road Initiative uh, from Malaysia's perspective, and particularly the East Coast Rail Link. In the studio with me, I have two guests to talk about the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, on my right, I've got uh, Dato Wei Chuan Beng, who is the co-chairman of Com Group. Now, Comcom is a subsidiary of China's Silk Road Group, uh, a joint venture with his company, Digital Way Group. And of course, furthest to me is Dr. O. A. Sun, who is an international relations commentator. Um, so we'll be checking in with them to discuss about these two particular bits in a bit. But first of all, the prosperity of the Asian region as a whole depends on cooperation and trade. Now, with China being the region's major powerhouse, um, uh, countries in the Asian continent, especially Southeast Asia, uh, can benefit from the spillover effect. Now, to achieve that, a holistic transport network plays a key role in ensuring that commerce and trade trickle down the entire supply chain and, uh, and of course, the support chain as well. Hence, the East Coast Rail Link plays an integral part in China's Belt and Road Initiative in Malaysia. Now, Bernama TV's producer Mirza Hassan compiled this report. The project, designed to facilitate the transport of goods, including palm oil, timber and other commodities from the East Coast states to the West Coast ports for export purposes, is a joint venture between Malaysia Rail Link and China Communications Construction. The railway will be used for both passenger and freight transport, linking Peninsula Malaysia's East Coast states such as Kelantan, Trungganu and Pahang with the West Coast states such as Negeri Sembilan, Selangor and the Federal Territory of Putrajaya, Jaya, which is currently only partially connected by rail. Passenger services will be operated by a fleet of 11 set of six-car electric multiple unit trains, each accommodating up to 440 passengers. The EMUs will be eco-friendly and produce less noise than other electrically powered trains. Right, spanning approximately 665 kilometres from Kota Baru and Kelantan all the way to Port Klang and Slango. The rail network will be able to not only boost trade but also create job opportunities for Malaysians. With the completion of this project and the train able to cut travel times to the West Coast, people living at East Coast can now acquire jobs in the Klang Valley, thus improving their income and well-being. This would also create more economic spillovers in areas along the ECRL route, whereby development and more job opportunities can be created, benefiting more Malaysians. On the national front, this major undertaking will also help inspire investor confidence, attracting both local and foreign investments. Following Malaysia's close economic relationships with China, its largest trading partner, the ECRL also greatly benefits both countries. With the ECRL able to bridge the gap between the east and west coasts of Malaysia, trade can be further expanded, causing an increase in Malaysia's GDP and providing China more access to Malaysian products and vice versa. Now, from China all the way to Southeast Asia, the rest of Asia, Europe, the Middle East and Africa, the entire Belt and Road Initiative will be able to link people and commerce from coast to coast. Mirza Hassan, Bernama TV. All right, now we're going to talk to our two guests right now regarding the Belt and Road Initiative. Well, first and foremost, Dr. Wei and uh, Dr. O, thank you so much for joining us. Now, um, collectively, now we talk about Malaysia benefiting from the Belt Road Initiative. I mean, what's your view regarding that? Well, I think, uh, first of all, uh, of course, we welcome more trade and investments with uh, China. And uh, under the Belt and Road Initiatives, uh, there are the five principles. 
And I think uh, trade facilitation is certainly one of them. And as we saw, of course, uh, with this East, uh, East Coast uh, Rail Link, we also have uh, facilitation of this uh, communications uh, infrastructures and so on. Uh, if we can, uh, for example, link the production centers in Malaysia with, uh, for example, uh, the uh, consumer base in China by mm -hmm. means of rail links, I think that will, of course, facilitate Malaysia's uh, trade uh, with China, not only through the sea routes, but also through the land routes. So uh, we look forward indeed for more export towards uh, China. Right, right. Dr. Wei, what do you think? Well, I come from uh, Kota Baru. Oh, okay. Is, Perfect. Right. Uh, the the right. last point that uh, at the East Coast, uh, East Coast Rail Link will uh, terminate. And I see this from the perspective of elevating the poverty because the, the two states, the Kelantan and Tengganu, that will be served by the uh, ECRL uh, among the poorer state. And we are very hopeful that it could actually bring so much more new opportunities in terms of job creation, in terms of bringing the produce out there so that it can improve the income and elevate the cost, uh, the standard of living of the people over there. Yeah. And apart from that, it will certainly also facilitate a lot more tourists coming to those part of the world. And I think that it has been the areas that deprive of development, deprive of investment, deprive of opportunities, and ECRL indeed present itself as a great opportunity to the people and the states. What about our national debts? I mean, obviously, you know, China has invested a lot in Malaysia as well. I mean, this is just one of many projects that they've got in the Belt and Road Initiative. So the thing is, I mean, as far as Malaysia is concerned, I mean, our national debt, I mean, considering the massive infrastructure that we have, I mean, may also require Malaysia to borrow more. I mean, that's something that I think will probably happen down the road. I mean, we can't really tell. So what can be the positive takeaway from this? Well, we, we certainly have very high degree of uh, foreign debt. Uh, uh, but I think uh, if we are borrowing from China, knowing uh, China, I don't think China would be... A, I think there's a Chinese idiom. Uh, you, 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 you don't uh, sort of throw a, uh, stones uh, down the wells, right? Uh, knowing that uh, if we are encountering problems in repaying our foreign debts and so on, I'm very confident the China side will re-evaluate the terms and so on, such that eventually we will pay our debts, uh, but perhaps not in a very uh, accelerated uh, manner. Yeah, yeah, I would think well, the same. Yeah. Well, debt is always very relative. Yeah, yeah, right? it is, it is. So in our case, we are like neither too high, certainly it's not low. And it is also a factor of how quickly can we raise our income of the country. Mm -hmm. Now, this kind of infrastructure is really with a, a done with the intention to raise the income level. If we stay on track, then the debt level will reduce. So it is just a matter of which at which point in time, uh, what kind of debt, and are, are we able to service them in the future? Is this too burdensome? I think uh, the balancing act is there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm confident that we do have sufficient wisdom to... Uh, make the best use of the ratio uh, for our purpose presently and also for the future of Malaysia, especially for the people. All right. So the thing is, uh, you you think that this particular uh, project that we have, the Belt and Road Initiative, is definitely a big boon to the country, even though there have been setbacks, so to speak. It, it is a necessity because we have been very much uh, stagnant since 97 and 8 until today. 25 years yeah, past, that's a long, that's a it's long time, high yeah. time that we really get a major upgrade. So basically now when we talk about the relationship that exists between Malaysia and China today, I mean, would you say that the relationship is at a level where mutual trust just exists? You know, I mean, they can trust each other, they take each other's word for it and everything else, for whatever we suggest and everything else. Have we reached that particular level? Well, I think uh, we are at a level where we feel very comfortable with one another. And that is because, um, you know, these bilateral relations between Malaysia and China is not purely on a government-to-government -government level. It's also, as we suggested just now, at a people-to-people -people, uh, level. For, for example, the small and medium enterprises in both countries, they conduct a lot of uh, trades with one another. And thereby, there's this very natural bond between the peoples of both uh, countries. And that actually drives this sort of uh, bilateral uh, relations. Right. Well, I think uh, trust could happen at the various levels. At the country level, at the industry level, as well as the, at the people level. And it has to start with understanding each other and especially facing the common interests and common 
uh, threats. Mm. At the country level, we see that a country, that means that leads to the industry and the people. What are those common threats? The threats of um, high interest rate, the threat of high inflation, the threat of environmental destruction, and all these things will bring us together. So we may uh, still have uh, some differences in terms of the way we approach things. However, when, we come, when it comes to really addressing some of the bigger uh, uh, agenda and common interests, I think this will then bring people together and therefore we don't even have to talk about trust because we are on the same boat. Let's pick up the conversations with our guests here on site. I mean, I want to come to you now. I mean, over the years, the BRI has been repeatedly accused by Western media of imposing unsustainable financial burdens on developing countries. On this topic, the Malaysian transport minister had this to say, that any government would consider, seriously consider the benefits and costs before committing to a project of this scale. That makes sense to me. Is it going to be convincing enough for those that doubt? Uh, well, I think these kind of allegations will always come out after any Chinese initiative, especially in these African countries or elder countries that are trying to uh, pick up this developing uh, economy or something like that. But, well, for sure, uh, every time we want to invest in infrastructure, we want to get an international corporation, it's, it's really important to look into the benefits and the cost of every uh, every challenge or every project. But at the same time, I think also China is not known by uh, any uh, influences or how the things should be done or how to manage the country or stuff like that. But at the other side, I think um, African country or even local governments, when they cooperate with China, I think they got a lot to learn from China in terms of governance. Uh, if we take some numbers of uh, state-owned companies in China, even they are owned by the state, in other countries they may perform not very well, but in China, actually state-owned companies are very well performed which shows that the Chinese government's, governance sorry, has a, a very uh, a good performance along uh, business, along uh, economic development, and uh, stuff like that. So here I would always like to uh, invite our governments, local governments, to well, uh, how to say, uh, evaluate or evaluate the project before getting into any other commitments. At the other side, China is also a good school for uh, economy uh, in terms of, of development. So African countries can always learn from China, many, many, many things. Zoom, what do you make of what's been set there? You know, people are saying the BRI is facing declining momentum because of the claim of debt trap. What do you think? I think I, I do completely resonate with what Amin also said. One of the most important things to understand is that infrastructure development and the kind of, you know, the scale on which the Belt and Road Initiative has been envisioned, on which the partner countries are now communicating with Chinese uh, partners to develop their infrastructure, this scale is unprecedented. And when we look at the success of a hard infrastructure project, be it the Gwadar port, be it the railway linkages now being developed in Africa and parts of Asia, we have to think in the medium and long term what is their impact. At the same time, it's definitely a question of agency of the host countries. And we know that uh, the utilization, the ability of a country to utilize that investment will depend on how well you're doing your technical education, how well your governance system is structured to attract investment and outside uh, stakeholders from outside. All of this is a combination that developing countries are learning. And that's where you know our agency can be utilized in a more efficient way developing countries are learning from Chinese partners now how to build those surrounding structures to make sure this infrastructure is well utilized. And lastly, I think I also want to add that um, it is a disservice to developing countries to constantly tell them, you know what, China is doing this to you, China is doing Developing countries are actually exhausted with this mindset of someone, you know, who thinks they're superior, coming and telling you how to develop yourselves, what to prioritize, what you need. Instead, what China is doing is having conversations. And every Belt and Road investment, every major project is based on not just mutual consultation, but a plan, an idea that developing countries previously had. So, I, especially, you know, the last word that one of the analysts said, that we are all in the same boat. The development of uh, these regions, of especially the global south, is going to be a boost, a positive boost for the global economy. And that's where, you know, that's the perspective with which China is uh, paving the path 
for better, uh, a better mindset towards constructive development. Harvey, let me pick your brain on this also. I mean, these words of stigmatization, are they hurtful to the initiative itself? Obviously, the projects were launched on the basis of considerable political trust on the part of participating countries. With these words going around, do you think they might create a trust deficit in a way for anyone who has the potential or has the willingness to join? I think that's certainly the intention to create a trust deficit. But I don't think that it's working because the countries can see for themselves the progress they're making. And you know, it's said that imitation uh, is uh, the sincerest form of flattery. And so when you have a situation where President Trump had this half-baked uh, OBOR BRI project that never got off the ground, that uh, President Biden has the Build Back Better World, which basically uh, is a reaction to uh, China's initiative. This is a very sincere form of flattery. Okay, maybe it's going to be some competition if those programs, including the EU, uh, get off the ground. That's fine. In this case, competition is good. But I think the proof, as has been said, are in the results. And I believe especially the receiving countries in the global south who are working as partners with China, not as subjects of China, um, are going to be very, very satisfied, are very satisfied, and I believe the next 10 years of BRI are bright. Yeah, if you look at over the past 10 years, the BRI has gained more participants. It is playing a stronger role in regional development. So I guess that serves as a strong rebuttal to the claim that it's doing more harms than good. All right, everyone, thank you so much. Now let's find out from our audience where their thoughts lie on what we have just discussed with our guests here. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and we would appreciate it if you could let us know where you're from and who you intend to put your question to. Thank you, me again. And some of you just mentioned that the BRI has a bright future, and I agree with that. The prospects of the BRI is lim limitless, but it's often said that the opportunities are also compared with the challenges. So mm -hmm. what, what are the challenges uh, has the BRI faced so far? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Who do you intend to ask? Uh, anyone, maybe uh, there's someone in my left hand. I mean. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, uh, I think the, um, the BRI is, uh, is facing uh, some challenges as any normal uh, infrastructure project. And then uh, the challenge will be into how to allocate the resources efficiently. That will be one of the, uh, the worries that people should, uh, should uh, take in consideration. Uh, if you look into Africa, uh, a continent uh, very rich in terms of natural resources, but still struggling in terms of uh, economic development, rural development, and stuff like that. So the only worry that uh, as an African or as a uh, yeah, an African uh, citizen we would worry about is that how can we allocate these resources in terms of uh, better uh, sustainability and better prosperity for, for people. And then on the other hand side, I think also the competition that may come up from the uh, Western world with the, their new project in terms of infrastructure. But uh, as a third party uh, players, I think any competition is good for the people who would benefit from that. So uh, having competition is good, uh, hoping that people will benefit uh, most from the either BRI or from any other, any other uh, initiative. Thank I'll, you. I'll also quickly, quickly add. Uh, so we have uh, in Pakistan, uh, one of the challenges has been that, yes, we do have a lot of excellent hard infrastructure. We have the idea of the special economic zones. But we also need to train more people to be able to work as, you know, um, appropriate employees yes. of companies that we would like to. Uh, attract. So, so the, one of the challenges for countries is also, you know, how do we, at what pace should we do skills development training? At what, uh, what skills do we need? What kind of industries do we want to attract? And that's also part of the, now we say, phase two uh, discussions, and uh, this is being implemented. Different programs are being implemented to address the challenges. So, long story short, if you 
uh, observe the BRI, we say that it's evolving. And if you see and observe that evolution process, the evolution is a response. It is responsive to the ongoing challenges at every phase. So that's something interesting. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much. I think we have a gentleman in the back who would also like to ask a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm from Belsiu, Beijing Language and Culture University. So uh, speaking about Africa, I've heard uh, Dr. Bennett, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, oh, thank you. On my view, I feel like it's more about like <coughs> expert uh, uh, societies or industry that are winning, and the citizen in that area are like they don't really get the benefit of the the benefit of uh, like the resource that belongs to them. So I would like to know uh, what, um, like, what is prevent for uh, to make sure that everyone, even the the young generation, they can benefit from uh, those exploitation. Because if we think more, if we talk about the future, we should think more about the young generation. So this is my question. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I think uh, I can uh, clearly understand that people in Africa are very worried about what kind of benefit they may they may get in terms of BRI uh, or uh, Belt Road uh, Initiative. But when we also talk a lot about trade, we, we only think that trade is goes one way. It goes from China to export, but she's wrong. I mean, when we talk about trade, it goes the other two ways. China also needs so much natural resources that can come from Africa, that come from Central Asia or stuff like that. But also, China now is more and more open into the import. We can see the China uh, initiative about the uh, imported product since 2008, uh, Shanghai Exposition for the imported product. So this is also a great opportunity for uh, African uh, companies, uh, small companies, middle companies, or anything. Now you can see more and more Ethiopian coffee. You see more and more uh, products in the Chinese market. That's only come because China also built an infrastructure to promote and try to help these small businesses to come over to China to discover the Chinese market and try to sell their products in the in the domestic market because China stays one of the largest uh, like word like one of the two or second largest population in the world but not only that but economically speaking the purchasing power of the Chinese people are getting increasing and increasing if we look into the past uh, past three thirty years or something like that another point that we saw also mention over here when we talk about um, the uh, African or uh, the African communities or how they can develop this is also uh, I think a local issues that can be developed by the African uh, government that's why we say it's always good to understand from China how China has been done uh, all these uh, economic development. Maybe you are young or maybe you do not uh, like aware about what China have done in the past 40 years. But if you look into the Chinese statistic in the past 40 years, China has moved almost 500 people out of poverty. So all these economic uh, examples or models can be easily not exactly copied, but we can actually learn a lot from how to run our countries properly. All right, thank you again, everyone. And that is it for our first session of this special program. In our next session, we'll discuss the expansion and upgrade of the Belt and Road Initiative with Serbia's national broadcaster, RTS, and Indonesia's national broadcaster, TVRI World. Stay tuned. I'm Zhongshi. And I'm Li Chiu Thank you so much for watching, and bye for now.